If you've lived in Ohio for any length of time, you've probably heard of the three C's. Cleveland, Cincinnati, and... Columbus. After all, Charlene, without Columbus, we wouldn't have a show. Yeah, you're kind of right. never get to see you. You're tragic. Tragic. Yeah. You're right about that. Besides being the three biggest cities in Ohio and less than 250 miles apart, the three C's have been connected in a lot of ways throughout history. For instance, up until 1967, all three cities were directly connected by rail. That's right, Charlene. And in today's show, we're exploring some other 3C connections. One of them was the Little Miami Railroad, which became the first direct route from Cincinnati to Columbus back in 1853. Here's that story. <laughs> We're really excited to be here in Zeni, Ohio today to learn about the Little Miami Railroad and how it got started. It was started in Cincinnati, of course, Cincinnati being one of the bigger cities in the, uh, in the uh, state of Ohio. And uh, it was formed up uh, along the Ohio River, was the depot down there. And it built uh, up the Little Miami River. Uh, the first major uh, stop was at Milford, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And it was the depot there was right along the uh, the little Miami, and you could look out of the depot and see the river. Uh, then came on up into Xenia and uh, reached Xenia. Uh, 1845 was the uh, uh, first traffic up into Xenia. And then uh, they completed the little Miami up to Springfield, Ohio, the following year, uh, 1846. And that particular piece of track went right through downtown Xenia. Mm -hmm. Now they, they hauled passengers first and then they picked up freight. and. Uh, the railroads really took business away from the canals. They had had the new canal going into Cincinnati, but canal boat traffic was very slow. The railroad was much faster. Uh, canal speed was the speed of a horse or a mule. Uh, railroad speed was maybe 30 miles an hour, give or take a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, you uh, could ship bulk goods on a railroad. You could ship large amounts of goods on a railroad, whereas canal, you were more limited to how much you could ship. Right. And uh, early on, I'm told that uh, rather than shipping corn, they converted it to whiskey. And whiskey was shipped down to Cincinnati on originally river boats, ra rafts really, mm -hmm. and a little later on a canal. And, but uh, railroads came along and you could ship whole corn down to Cincinnati and uh, go down the Ohio River to the Mississippi. and um, raw materials could come back the opposite way, up the Mississippi, up the Ohio River. They proved to be more efficient. Oh yes, much more efficient, yeah. Less mm -hmm. costly, yeah. So how important was it to the development of the area? It was very important because the population grew from the 1840 census, the population grew probably almost triple in the 1850 census, federal census. Was it mainly uh, for freight or industry, or was it passenger rail as well? It was also passenger rail. Yeah, I think the, the thinking initially when they built a railroad was they haul passengers. And of course the freight went along with that, and that's where the money was made was in the freight. But uh, initially why you hauled people. And by the 1860s you were able to haul um, soldiers from Camp Denison and Camp Chase and go down to the south where they were needed. Tell me how the Little Miami Railroad came to Columbus. The Little Miami came to Xenia in 1846, and another company was formed, became the Columbus and Xenia. Of course, there was some talk of it going all the way to Cleveland, but it never did go that way. Um, by 1850, the Columbus and Xenia had been completed. The terminus was at Xenia. By 1860, the Little Miami and Columbus and Xenia had merged probably because they were going over the same area and they wanted to make that link to Columbus to have even more of an economic impact. One of the reasons that uh, the Columbus line went to Xenia was that the Little Miami merged with another railroad, connected with another railroad in Springfield that went on up to Lake Erie. 
So he, that was the first cross-state railroad from Cincinnati up to Lake Erie. So anything that uh, Columbus could ship down to Xenia, they could then ship either to Lake Erie or down to the Ohio River and then down to the Mississippi. So it gave them a good outlet for products from Columbus to, to get them out to the rest of the United States. Or they weren't United States in those days, but sure. I mean, they, the states that we did have. There were a number of railroads that they all came together. Each time the railroads would come to a common town and they'd merge their tracks so that they could interchange cars and then uh, they would then transfer freight and it got to be easier financially or paperwork wise you know to be one railroad rather than several railroads and so they, they grew that way and uh, even today you know the bigger is better. Did the Little Miami Railroad keep that name or did they just keep expanding names or come under the name of another railroad? Well, I, they probably ran out of room on the side of the car, L, M, N, C, and X, and D, X, and P, or whatever, <laughs> they probably ran out. So they did, they did eventually merge into another, another firm. So some of it was by leasing, some of it was uh, physically or outright buying the railroad. It was more leasing and sharing initially, and uh, uh, the individual railroads would keep their names. And then later on, as they actually merged, uh, they would reach a new name. Two railroads would combine, and they'd uh, get a new name. And this, as I said, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. They would change their names on a somewhat regular basis as they, as they grew. And uh, the, what became the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, initially was a bunch of other little lines. And as they grew and grew together, they, uh, they eventually uh, ended up being the Pennsylvania Railroad, which came in from the eastern United States. And they continued to go through Columbus. Between Xenia and the eastern United States was Columbus, so you know, that was a way for the east-west traffic to move. Now we have a collection of photographs and books here. What are we looking at? This is a photo of a painting that we have, and it shows the old depot, the old lower depot. And this is where the soldiers boarded the trains in the 1860s at this lower depot. This building was torn down in 1955. And the picture over here is the upper depot with the dinky beside it. And that one was built specifically for the Little Miami Railroad. And that it, you had to stop there before you came downtown or went down to this lower depot. This was on Detroit yeah, Street. Yeah. It was torn down in 1941. And this is a photo just across the line into Warren County of the Little Miami Railroad, and it's clearly marked here, Little Miami Railroad, on the engine. And this is just at Foster's Crossing, which is just, like I said, south. This is another picture of the depot, the lower depot. This, it says, view of station house at Xenia. And this actual locomotive, the coal car, or the wood car, actually, it's not coal, says, L, M, and C, X Railroad. So Little Miami and Columbus and Xenia Railroad, they had merged. This is the depot as I remember it when we moved here in 1951. It looked a lot like that. But it didn't have the steam car. Oh, of course not, no. <laughs> they still had steam locomotives, but they didn't look like that. This has got the big wide funnel of the steam coming yeah. out. And the humongous cow catcher, because they actually did catch cows and horses. It was still a pretty <laughs> rural area. Oh, yes. Yes. And then the map over here is Little Miami Railroad to the Hand of Man, 1840 to 1870. Of course, it was still in its planning stages in 1840, but still. And then the far side is Little Miami, Columbus, and Xenia, and Hillsboro and Cincinnati Railroads. And it's a timetable, 1853. This is a Columbus and Xenia Railroad Company quarterly dividend from 1925. And this Edward Worthington, he got $170.50 to get paid for his dividend by holding stock in the Columbus and Xenia Railroad. So in 1925, they're still paying dividend checks, even though they've been gone for some time. Now, when was the final year of operation for the Little Miami Railroad? Through, through downtown Xenia was 1967. Well, it wasn't the Little it was, Miami it was by the that Pennsylvania time. Railroad at that point, but it, but it was the original trackage and roadbed. What remnants are there of the railroad here in Xenia? Well, all of the rail lines and rail beds have been turned into 
uh, multi-use paved trails, the Rails to Trails movement. The only active rail in Greene County is at Fairborn. Thank you for telling me about the history of the Little Miami Railroad and its connection to Columbus and joining us on Columbus Neighborhoods. Thank You're you for welcome. Thank you for coming. Railroads ran between the three seas throughout history, but streetcars were another important connection point within these cities. Especially here in Columbus. Although streetcars are no longer running, there are remnants that still exist. There's actually a new historic trolley district on the east side of Columbus that's using old streetcar barns for new purposes. And I hear it's a beautiful space. It really is, and just wait till you see it. We're driving east on Oak Street, just outside downtown Columbus. Oak Street is one of the streets that was served by the streetcars. And in those days, uh, nobody lived in Columbus in any more than three blocks from a streetcar line. It really was remarkable how easy it was for people to get around without a great deal of difficulty because the streetcars were so accessible. We're headed to what used to be a big complex for the street railway company here in Columbus. These are known as the trolley barns today. Uh, they were empty for a long time. They were in private ownership by an owner who really didn't know what to do with them. Finally were acquired by a local developer and their, uh, their rebirth has begun. Uh, and I think we're going to have a very good visit uh, to see what's going on here today. Hi, Brad. How are Hi, you? Jeff. Good yeah. to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Wow, what a place. What a change. Yeah, I know. This, uh, this is a lot different from what it used to be, and I notice it even has its tracks back again. Yeah, yeah. We put these back in uh, about last year. The tracks did kind of run in two parallel lines, and it was under asphalt. There historically was not a basement under this. We dug out a 15-foot basement, and then at the end, we wanted to add some of these details, like in the entry having this switch that kind of runs through and it outlines the pathways of the market. Now, I remember seeing this complex getting worse over the years. It must yeah. have been a challenge to take it on. It was. The people of the area were really passionate about trying to keep the historic fabric mm -hmm. as we are as a development company. So it took a long time to plan it out. This has been a, it's been a labor of love for a few years. So what you've accomplished is the, the main building here, known as the East Market, which is I think is great because, of course, the city used to have public markets. North Market is still there, West Market is gone, Central Market is gone, but East Market is back again. And I think that's just great that there's this public market for the neighborhood yeah, and for all yeah, of the city. Absolutely. So we looked at it as this area was a food desert. We wanted to do something you know, in this area to where the community could come in, have a selection, people locally owned businesses could come and actually apply their trade and have an area that's more of a gathering place. So I can see the old building. Uh, clearly it's still here, the brick walls, the wood structure. How did you approach making this into a marketplace? So we had excavated the entire basement. It's about 15 feet below us. And we had support poles on the outer walls holding it up. Wow. And there was a huge storm that came through and actually pushed in the wall over here on the north end and we had to do a demolition then of that wall. But what it allowed us to do also was, when we had it pulled out, we got to come through and we created a steel infrastructure for the building that allowed us to make an event space upstairs. That's a good point, because these old buildings are reusable, but they don't necessarily comply with current codes and they have to, have to do a lot of updating. Yeah. And you found a way to do it economically. Uh, it was a certified historic rehabilitation, as I yes. recall. The federal programs and the state programs that are available for historic structures really make it a possibility. Let's go see some more. All right, sounds great. So what space are we in now? So this is Railhouse. So Railhouse is our 
eatery slash tavern. Okay. And what we did is, in the market space, we went with white, clean, semi-sterile colors to kind of invoke daytime. But as you come into Rail House, this is convertible for at night. So, tell me about the wall here. So the blocks that are on the wall are actually blocks that were in the floor of the blacksmith shop. Uh -huh. So the blacksmith shop is part of what is going to be Columbus Brewing Company's flagship restaurant. These blocks were repurposed to be used for artwork here, and we're, we're pretty proud of them. I think we brought out 4,000 of them. Wow. Would have been easy just to bulldoze them up and throw them away, but I'm glad you saved them. They looked like bricks on the floor, and yeah. when we pulled them up, we found out they were wood, and we started to see well, some they, of the knots. One reason they do them is because they absorb oil, the floor doesn't get slippery, yep. uh, but it does change what they look like, too. Absolutely. So what we did is we clear-coated everything here and, and sealed all that in. But yeah, and tell me about the artwork. I mean, it's a great picture. We were referred to an artist named Duarte, mm -hmm. and we had historic photos of all the trolley cars. Yep. And he was so good that he literally just took the photos that we had. I mean, he came back with one draft, and we were just like, wow. It was so much better than we could have even imagined. The top right building up there is actually, uh, it's the West Car Barn, which is right. what we're in, also right. known as the paint shop. Yep. The different time frames of trolley cars, all of these were significant to Columbus right. and uh, all the way down to buses. We feel like we, you know, we got an incredible piece for the times. Well, that's great and it's a, it's a wonderful space. Thank you, thank you. So there, there's one last place I would like to show you. Oh, of course. All right. Well, Glad to look at it. Sounds great. Oh, Brad, another great space. Uh, where are we now? So this is the speakeasy that we have. We're, we're below <laughs> okay. the market right now. This, okay. this is called Switch. And we named it Switch because out here, just outside, is where they had all the switch gear for the trolley cars when they would pick a direction as to which way they were going to go. So this actually was the only three rooms that were a basement of this building, um, which is now the East Market. We dug a basement under the, another 14,000 square feet on the other side of the wall behind us, but they have these barrel brick walls and we had to remove all the brick uh, for these arches as we put a precast flooring system above it to support the weight and then we rebuilt all of these as they historically were. But one of the big things that we, we were really excited about is all of the pavers that we're standing on right now mm -hmm. were pulled out of the parking area outside. The old brick, brick yeah, pavers. Yeah, all the, all the pavers. We Those cleaned a total of 11,000 pavers. Wow. And uh, we <laughs> used some of them outside. Uh, your, your attention to detail is incredible. And this looks like a very private, small space. How do you use the space in here? It's, it's called the speakeasy for a reason. It is, it is speakeasy. So we wanted to make sure it was open to everybody. Um, but like a true speakeasy is, we, you know, we specialize in whiskey and bourbon and um, in order to get in, that door outside is locked at all times. So on Thursday, right now on Thursday through Sunday, uh, if you purchase a drink upstairs at Rail House, on the bottom of your invoice is a password. You come down, you knock on the door, and the bartender will open and, and uh, let you in. So without a password, Al Capone could not get in? Absolutely not. <laughs> well, this is a spectacular tour you've given us at a, at a, at a great rehabilitation project. What are future plans do you have coming up? So this is the largest of all the buildings, and obviously it was the most intricate because of the market and the infrastructure that's behind us right now is incredible. But this is actually one of five buildings. Okay. So the second building that we're doing is what used to be called the mechanic shop, and that's where they would take the trolley cars in, do their work, turn them around, and send them out. Uh, that is actually going to be uh, Columbus Brewing Company. So you see all of the remaining buildings getting developed over time. So we have tenants for almost all. And then if, if you go to the other side of the, of the property, the large building, 25,000 square feet on the far east end is the East Car Barn. And the East Car Barn right now has the wall down and they're rebuilding that structure because partway through the development, when we opened up the roof, in between the wides of the brick, all of the mortar had eroded. <laughs> So we, we had does to go, happen. Yes, yes. And we had to go back and we had to take it all down, clean the brick and, re, and relay it. You have to do certain things to make sure the place is stable and lasts for a long time. But then you've overlaid another level of detail that really gives a wonderful character to the place. So I have to thank you for such a great tour and for doing such a good job here and for being willing to come to talk to us about what's going on at the East Market here at the Old Trolley Barn. Oh, my pleasure and we appreciate everything that you do for Columbus. Thank you.
We're connecting the Ohio three C's from Cincinnati to Columbus and now on to Cleveland. And what better way to connect to Cleveland than through an actual bridge? If you've ever passed over this Cleveland bridge and marveled at its iconic guardian pylons, this next story is for you. I'm David Simmons, author of the article on Cleveland's Guardians, and I'm interested in telling you a little bit more about this unique structure. I'm Bill Eichenberger, and I'm the editor of the Ohio History Connections membership publication, Echoes Magazine. What interests me about the story is the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge uh, is really emblematic of Cleveland in the 20th century the highs of the 1920s and 30s, the lows of the 1970s and 80s. And now, uh, in a new century, uh, the, the Guardians sort of watch over the city. Public art is something that people uh, have strong feelings about. But in this case, these are such monumental additions uh, that they're like nothing else in the state, they're so unique that they really need to be preserved, and that's what makes them special to me. Henry Ford was the one that came up with the idea of everyone owning an automobile, and Cleveland got a factory for Ford in 1914. So as a result, Cleveland's streets were full of automobiles. The whole history of the automobile in this country is the roads desperately trying to catch up to the automobile. <laughs> the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge was all about getting traffic over the flats. The flats is a warehouse and industrial area right in the middle of the city. Throughout the 1920s, Cleveland was so committed to the future and progress that they decided that they wanted to build this Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. The bridge was a collaboration between an engineer and an architect. Wilbur Watson was the engineer, and he was very interested in bridge architecture and hired Frank Walker to help him design and make the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge appealing and attractive by adding these guardians that were holding different modes of transportation in their hands. In the 1970s, we saw the beginning of uh, the decline of the steel industry in northeastern Ohio. Uh, at the same time, we were seeing the deterioration of the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. De-icing was one of the main factors. These Ohio winters were just brutal. Actually had to close the sidewalks, close two of the outside lanes, and uh, all the while the air pollution was darkening the guardians themselves to the point that they looked shabby and, and worn out. The bridge survived the 1970s, and by the early 1980s, the city uh, was going to rehabilitate it. Through the historic preservation processing, they were saved, but they also agreed to clean all the years of grime and dirt off the, off the pylons. The soot had turned these Art Deco pylons from more of a beige color to, to, to black. The technicians that were doing that agreed to leave one bit of darkened stone, and that was the, the coal in the, in the bed of the coal truck. They thought, this should stay black, just because that's more realistic. When I first heard that the Indians were changing their name to the Guardians, I was indifferent about the name uh, at best. And then I read an article that quoted Paul Dolan, the Indian's owner, saying that he rode his bicycle from his office at Progressive Field across the bridge every day and he said that even though the name came without consideration of the Guardians, that it makes perfect sense for the city. Now the only question is whether or not the Guardians can help the team protect an eighth or ninth inning lead. <laughs>
Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly Twitter. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. so small I wish there was more that I could do I Sit and wait Seems to make it work But when I see the strength that you